Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the world's most interesting scientists, inventors, and everybody else changing the future on the program. Today we got somebody doing that, Karen Lloyd. Thanks for coming today, Karen. Thanks for having me. So my son loves this song from the, oh, what's the Disney movie with uh, The Little Mermaid, A Whole New World. And that's exactly what you're breaking down. I, I sing it, I try, to, I try to rock the Jamaican voice and all of that. But a whole new world. That's the that's the focus for this podcast. So tell me a little bit more. You're a micro marine biologist thereabouts. I'm approximating trying to explain it. Tell me 30,000 foot view. Who are you? And then let's go deep. I does it give the wrong impression if I start with correcting you on Disney knowledge? No, that's perfectly good. I think it's from Aladdin. A whole new world. It's the carpet. Oh, you're you're right. I wasn't thinking of a whole new world. Yeah, I was thinking of under oh, the sea. Kid, that under the sea. Yeah. Oh, this is Sorry. this is very important, guys. Disney is lessons for life. <laughs> yeah, the movies have gotten better since then, honestly. Um. So so sorry. What did you ask? <laughs> so thirty thousand foot view. Who is Karen Lloyd? And then let's go deep into the water. Yeah. So I started out in oceanography um, for my PhD, and I, I honestly I picked oceanography because I could not decide whether I wanted to be a chemist, a biologist, or a physicist. I just liked all the different disciplines. And then it occurred to me that discipline boundaries are a human construct and they're not real anyway. So I should pick a PhD in a place rather than a specific type of research. And then I could do all of them. So I and started out in oceanography. Sorry? And you wanted to pick a place, i.e. the beach, or a place, i.e. A, a topic or a theme? Well, oceanography is what I picked. Um, and that's just simply because I got to be super interdisciplinary um, with oceanography. And, um, and that's, it was all it was cracked up to be. You know, you, it's sort of the way that people approach the discipline. Um, since you, you have to get by with whatever samples you get, sometimes you're sometimes battling difficult conditions out at sea or, you know, just infrequency of cruises, um, you have to, it forces you to be creative, to think on the spot, and to come up with new analyses to, to solve really what seem like they're intractable problems. And I just found that to be um, utterly entrancing. Uh, so that, that's sort of how I got into this whole um, looking at um, microbes out in, the, out in the world, out in the oceans. Um, but specifically, I was focusing on underneath the ocean. So like right at the sea surface floor. So <clears throat> I spent um, a fair amount of my time during my PhD looking at um, organisms in, in the mud, in the marine mud. And then as I became a professor and got to um, expand my horizons a bit and do other things, it occurred to me that sometimes the subsurface has water on it, and we call it an ocean, uh, the deep oceanic subsurface, and sometimes it's not covered with water at all. Um, but I'm equally interested in both of those places. And from what I know, we know more about space than we know about the deep ocean. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about the way that you derive data, like how do you gather data about a place? Um, light is just a wonderful way to get data about stuff. And if you're looking through a vacuum or if you're looking through a thin atmosphere, you can derive quite a bit of information for, from objects that are very far away. So in that way, um, I wouldn't want to say that things are well known out in space. Of course, there's huge mysteries that, that are very enticing. Um, but you do have the advantage of light. When you try to look down into the earth, there's nothing. It, there's very little signal that comes up. Um, maybe the only equivalent would be earthquakes. Um, so people who do passive seismics are not me. These are other folks, uh, geophysicists, who use earthquakes that are happening naturally to track what sorts of materials they move through in the deep earth. Um, that would be similar to looking at uh, light coming in from space. But you know, we don't have the same sort of abundance of data because we have to drill down and we have to go down and it's very um, pinpoints, like pinpricks. And the tech to do it is incredibly high tech and expensive. Where are we in the state of actually starting to explore the ocean? What have we explored? What's happening today? What's exciting? Yeah, so exploring the oceans is, is obviously still a major frontier. Um, most of the exploration that's been done happens um, very close to countries that put a lot of effort into research and maybe not so much in, in other places. Um, and, but that's just the oceans. Uh, when I think of the oceans, that's the, the surface world um, to me. Going down deep beneath the oceans, it, um, you get diminishing amounts of information back. So um, if the oceans are very, very unknown, what's underneath them is even less unknown. 
I'm sorry, even more unknown. Yeah, it's uh, it's what's what's his name? Um, the, uh, I'm not gonna think of the name. The little guy who had the the world underneath the earth, and it's obviously not true. But we know we know very very little. What's the what's the actual value to studying the ocean? A lot of people say, what's the point of going to Mars? What's the point of X Y Z when we have so many problems here at home, so to speak? Yeah. So the well, if you if you're talking about the subsurface, I mean it's underneath all of us. So this is a resource that we have just literally underneath our noses. And we haven't, I mean, if you sort of want to think of it as a, what can we get from it sort of way, it's pretty much untapped. I mean, when we get, when we look at the microbes that we pull out of these places, and I'll, I'll say too, that this is often true of some surface microbes as well. Um, and we start cataloging the genes that they have in their genomes. Um, what we find is that a lot of their genes are just like, we just toss our hands up and we're like, I don't know. It's a, it's a collection, it's a string of DNA sequences, and we know it's not fake because it came from nature, but we just don't know what it is. So I think about how much we know about the known world of enzymes and activities and metabolic pathways and the wealth of information that we, we know about biology. And then there's this sort of dark side of their genomes that we don't know that could be doing anything. And we've we've had so many breakthroughs and benefits just from what we've learned of what we know and what we don't know that we don't know is oftentimes so many more orders of magnitude bigger. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, this is kind of, it's kind of like researching an alien species in effect. Yeah, I think so. That's, that's how it feels to me. I know that um, some of my uh, colleagues have called them intraterrestrials instead of extraterrestrials, which I kind of like, I always like that. Um, but yeah, these, these parts of their genomes are just unknown. How do we take what we learned from this? So in theory, if we're thinking about life in the universe, life out there somewhere, odds are A, it exists in certain places, and B, it's not incredibly all that similar to us. Is this something where these are the kind of creatures and microbes we could be modeling of maybe these guys are on Titan, maybe these guys are on here. How, how do you think about that? And do you work with space agencies, et cetera, at all? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> I've worked a fair amount with NASA <clears throat> ever since, you know, my very first project as a PhD student was funded by NASA. And I just recently had one funded as well. Um, it's, you know, the understanding the breadth and limits of life here on Earth is absolutely essential for understanding anything about where it's going to be or what it might like be like when we get there. I mean, wouldn't it be something if our <clears throat> space exploration technology advanced to the point where we were able to actually prove that there was life on Europa in the, sub, um, in the subsurface waters of Europa, and then it, we turned out, it turned out that it was something that actually lives here on Earth, and we just didn't know it because we still haven't explored Earth. <laughs> and that would be crazy. But, but technically that could happen because we're still discovering new phyla in the subsurface. So I don't know if phyla is a word that people immediately know. Let's go into it. Do you remember King Philip came over from Great Spain, kingdom phylum, uh, class, order, family, species, it may be, um, so Super high up there on the family tree, a way, way off. Bring, yeah, bringing back some like pain of having to take biology tests, but... Um, it's a very, very high level on the phylogenetic tree. So, so a very deep branch. Um, all vertebrates are a phylum. Um, I think it's still, that's still true. Um, so we're talking about something that is really, really distantly related to anything, anything at all. We're still discovering them. There are phyla on earth that we don't know anything about. Are we discovering more at this point than we are exterminating in terms of land species or would that be just still nowhere near the same magnitude? It's hard to compare the two because um, when we're talking about animals and plants, suddenly species take on much greater importance. Um, you know, we, it's, it's really, really significant if we lose an entire species of an insect or if we lose the polar bears or something like that. that is a, that's a major tragedy. Whereas it'd be hard to um, print the same level of concern for losing one species of bacteria, maybe. <laughs> Um, but there's actually kind of an active debate that I don't have a big opinion on about whether it's possible for bacterial species to go extinct at all. It's hard to prove. We're certainly trying with these hand sanitizers. They've made us sicker than ever. 
It's um, how do you think about funding for something like this? Where I got to imagine there's two possible, maybe three possible different sources. There's government funding. There's something to do with big oil trying to find more oil. And then there would be people trying to commercialize things they find underwater. For instance, maybe strains of microbes. Maybe they're searching for diamonds and trace minerals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's lots of different um, angles, I think, for for why you would want to fund such research. I mean, there's um, there's do you know about uh, biological batteries? Do you know about bioelectricity stuff? So um, basically microbes catalyze the transfer of electrons. So which is basically what a battery does. So you can make a bio battery in marine sediments by putting in a cathode and an anode, and you can use it to power very, very low power things. Um, this is something that the Navy does a fair amount. Um, it's, it's in use. So if we could sort of engineer microbes to be more efficient at this process, then maybe we could get a higher flux of energy through these things and have higher power to, to power things. Is that the next breakthrough in terms of manufacturing, biomanufacturing? We've got a lot of advancements in terms of CRISPR and editing specific genes. Do you see and do you see the people that you're working with looking into actively replacing traditional spoke manufacturing, so to speak, with biological machinery? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm really on the discovery end of things. So there's pe there are people who just know so much more about this, but it's interesting that you bring up CRISPR-Cas because that is a system that was discovered in Archaea just as a like, oh look, here's a weird thing in a weird group of organisms. And now it's revolutionizing how we manipulate genes in bioengineering. So, you know, another example is TAC polymerase, which is an enzyme, it used to be the only enzyme that we were, that we had to use to be able to work with DNA for any application. And that was discovered from Thermos Aquatic which is a naturally occurring bacteria in hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. So these are sort of like examples of the kind of big hits for humanity that come from just staring at some really weird stuff and imagining what you can find. Does the anti-science movement scare you in terms of people are either A, scared of science, or B, not wanting to fund just fundamental research, where you don't know what you're going to get from fundamental research, but you often get a lot? I think what terrifies me about the anti-science feel is people not respecting reality. Um, you know, not, not understand. I want people to have a firm understanding of what's real and what's not real to know that, for instance, um, I heard recently someone say, oh yeah, people have definitely been to Mars. It's like, no, no one's been to Mars. <laughs> and they cited all these examples, but they weren't real examples. <laughs> And that breaks my heart a little bit because it, it's just, it's, we cannot compete with Hollywood for flash. I mean, we don't, I do a lot of the, the things that people do on CSI, but I don't have like a, an instant machine that tells me immediately what the answer is. It takes more time and it's messier and, you know, it's hard to say what things are. Like science has so much gray area sometimes, but I think it competes for attention, for people's attention and loses. And that, that sort of makes me sad. Especially because scientists aren't the most charismatic and salesy of people. Yeah, yeah, we lack that sometimes. Definitely. What's the most interesting part about your work as an oceanographer? You're in a space where, I mean, a lot of people's dreams is to make enough money so that they can go and either live on or work on the beach. You're yeah. kind of doing that in a way, but you're also getting on the boats. What's it like? Um, I love doing field work. It's amazing. Um, it's, it is why, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, certainly because you're, you're analyzing data and you're writing papers, other people will go collect your samples for you. No, the point is to go out there and collect my own samples. And it's especially now like um, helping graduate students, my own graduate students, you know, they need to be the ones out there collecting their own samples. But there are many, many times in my life where I just look around at some gorgeous place where I am and say, I cannot believe this is my job. I can, I can definitely imagine. You, you've done deep into the Mariana Trench. You've looked at the fjords. What's the most incredible trip or experience you've had and why? Man, that would be so hard to nail down. Um, diving in Alvin was pretty incredible. Um, diving in the Johnson Sea Link, which is another... Um, human occupied vehicle was also just incredible. I mean, just being 
being down physically at the bottom of the sea, it changes things. I don't really know how, but it's hard because we often argue, similar to with space travel, we say, well, human occupied vehicles are so much more risky, they're so much more expensive, let's just send robots. And we have plenty of really great robots. We have remotely operated vehicles that, that do a fantastic job um, under the ocean, but I don't know. I just think it's really important to go. It's mind blowing. Plus everybody wants to be an astronaut. It's going to be hard to convince these guys. Sorry, you're not, you're not going. So yeah. you've been down there. You've done the Captain Nemo deal. I've heard, ter I've heard terrible things in terms of potential shifts in the salinity of the, the salt content of the oceans from the rising global temperatures. Can you dive a little bit more into that just based off of your background? Are you talking about the shutdown of the thermohaline circulation in the Northern Atlantic? Yeah, basically there's the, the you can say it better than I can, but the underwater currents that move things around and keep us all essentially alive. Yeah, as far as I understand, um, that does seem to be slowly, slowly occurring. So this is the source of the movie The Day After Tomorrow, which was a ridiculous movie. Um, it's a, you know, it's a hyperbole movie as, as a lot of sci-fi movies are, but that's based on real scientific theory. Um, they just, for the movie, they sped up the shutdown of thermohaline circulation immediately. I mean, this, the reason why such an eventuality would be a problem is that so much of what our ocean ecosystems depend on and also our weather systems depend on is to a first order approximation. You can kind of think of water moving through our oceans like a conveyor belt. And one of the things that's important for this is water getting salty and heavy in the northern part of the Atlantic and sinking and getting cold. And this moves southward underneath. So when you think of the Gulf Stream shooting on the east coast of the United States, that's all a surface phenomenon. Underneath, there's a much broader and wider and slower movement of um, water moving south. So if that all stopped or changed substantially, then where we get water heating, or sorry, where we get atmospheric heating, where we get atmospheric cooling, how the winds move, where, where the fish can be, the temperatures in different places, all of this would shift. Um, but I, there, there are other people who know a lot more than I do about what's happening with that right now. But if it, if it is happening, it would be very bad. And coral as well, just reducing the, just when you're playing, when you're playing with a fire of a Pandora's box that kind of feels like a, a black swan type deal, it pays to, it pays to play slowly. Yeah. Um, see, see what's happening. Yeah. The, the problem with climate change is that it's happening so rapidly compared to changes that we've seen over the um, time that humans have been on earth previously. It's like driving your car towards a cliff. You better hit those brakes at least a hundred feet ahead of time or you're going over. That's right. Yeah. What a, speaking of, in addition to climate change, what are you most worried about today? Technologies, trends, et cetera. Honestly, I worry about GMOs, genetically modified. Um, and, and when I say that, I don't mean I'm worried about them. I'm worried about people's perception of them. I, I'm not going to say they're absolutely safe, no problems. I personally don't feel like the hype that's around them for being the anti-GMO hype is fully backed up by science and it worries me because there's so much good that can be done by genetic modification of things. And we've been genetically modifying crops for centuries. I think, I think the big issue for this is lack of understanding. So I, I've spoken with a couple of people who are pretty sharp on the topic and looked at a couple of research papers. It seems like the supposed cause of GMOs being a problem has nothing to do with the organism being modified. It has to do with the type of pesticide that it allows you to use. So mm -hmm. apparently glyphosate is not so nice on the microbes in your stomach mm -hmm. is my understanding. So it messes up your gut biome, which we're finding out more and more is incredibly important. Yeah, right. It is. Well, that's, you know, if, if that's the kind of negative outcome, then that's a specific negative outcome for a specific type of gene. Um, what worries me is the fear of all GMOs and that that, that will never be um, a solution that can be used. Um, to take it completely off the table, I think, is short-sighted. To say always and to say never implies you will almost always be wrong. Because <laughs> yeah. There are always cases where 
things are good that are bad or bad that are good. Got to kill this guy to save a hundred million, et cetera, et cetera. It's, um, it's, a, it's a complicated and messy world. What has you the most excited? Well, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I'm excited about how much life there is deep down in earth. I mean, it's not a given. When we started doing this stuff, I mean, I think the first true deep subsurface organism was only discovered in the late 80s. And it took a long time for them, for you know, the community to really accept that this was real and widespread. But up until even when I started my PhD, it was possible that just life just kind of petered out very quickly as you start to go down. And it doesn't. I, I find that um, like heartwarming that there is so much life going so deep into the earth and we don't know how far it goes and we don't really understand what it's doing. So to me, I find that encouraging because it's just such a wide open space. What I find interesting and encouraging was that you were trying to grow some of these cells in a in a petri dish and seeing absolutely nothing happening. What are what is your research indicating in terms of possible longevity interests going forward? That is definitely one of my major major uh, focuses. And the this may not be true, but in the back of my head, I always think, you know, we know that these organisms have very very long lives. They have to just simply because you can't. The thermodynamics don't work out right. If you look at the amount of energy that's available to them and the amount of energy it would take to support their own cells dividing so many times, it can't happen. So they have to be very, very slow. And so given that they're very, very slow in nature, I always wonder, is that why no one has ever grown some of these deep branches on the tree of life in a laboratory setting? Just because they don't, they never will. They are basically unculturable on our time scales. Um, it's just hard. I don't want to say that for, it's kind of like you were saying, you don't want to be absolutist about anything because people all the time are discovering new organisms that do grow and are finding ways to convince them to be fast. But I think the question of how, how like what are the mechanisms that allow an individual bacterial cell to just hang out and not do much of anything for a thousand years, a hundred thousand years, a millennium? It's all possible, that's on the table. We're starting to crack into some of the mechanisms, hopefully. Well, I mean, that whole frozen Captain America deal, that's not so far off from the truth in terms of we put people on ice, they kind of stop dying, that yeah. we can extend life. So it, would you imagine it's something along those lines that's yeah. happening here? I don't know about um, translating that to humans, just because humans are such complicated things. You know, I'm, I'm focused more on single cells, you know, just how does a cell, and maybe some of that, some of those mechanisms could be used for larger organisms as well, but that's just not, man, keeping your cells alive is not equivalent to keeping yourself and like your soul alive. It's sort of a different question. Um, it, it's almost inverted. So what I've seen in terms of longevity is when you get cells, if you have bad cells, you want those guys to die quickly. It's called autophagy. And if you're getting rid of your negative cells faster than you're building, or essentially the faster you're getting rid of the negative ones, the less negative nannies you have, so to speak, to mess with the other cells. It's interesting if you were to slow down the whole process. I, have, you had, have you had longevity companies, companies like Calico, et cetera, with Google, reach out to you in terms of research? I have never heard of that company. I didn't know that existed. <laughs> it's, 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 it's Alphabet's little Larry Page and Sergey Brin don't want to die. So let's have a company to try to figure that out deal. <laughs> That's really funny. No, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, all these, all these Silicon Valley guys are trying it these days. Some, some, they're all trying to go to space so they can win that pissing contest, but they all really don't want to die. And that's more important than winning that that's contest. Really funny. I can't imagine not wanting to die. Yeah, some of these people are doing blood transfusions with the young guys. It's, a, it's an interesting world. So speaking of interesting world, what's this theory I hear about octopuses or octopi? I'm not entirely sure on the, the pronunciation. Octopus. I know that. Somebody corrected me. It's octopuses? Yes. Perfect. Octopuses potentially being transmuted from space in terms of there's something to do with the, the amount of RNA or DNA in their, in their genetic sequences are different than almost everything else on Earth. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> Interesting. I, I remember hearing about it on a podcast. I looked into it and it was something to do with most species have 23 chromosomes and Possibly octopuses had 24, but I don't want to quote that as being a fact. 
So we'll have to look it up, guys. What uh, if you were to make? Let's see. I'm thinking. So the oceans. What's what's something most people don't know about the oceans? What's the biggest myth? Oh, the biggest myth about the oceans. Well, that's hard because because I'm standing from the same point of being an oceanographer. So maybe I don't have a good handle on what like general people know or don't know about it. I will tell you something I don't, I don't think people necessarily know, um, which is that as you fall through, so in a sitting in a submarine, um, the way you get down to the bottom is not by using power. You turn off all the power, you save your battery so you can have a longer dive and you just fall. You just let gravity pull you. When you do that, there um, are constantly organisms and goo smacking against your portholes and glowing and it's like being in warp drive in star trek or whichever one does warp drive i can never remember but you know it's like stars going past your portholes so if you think of the oceans like deep in the oceans as just like a big bowl of water that has a couple of whales swimming through it and the occasional shark then don't think of it like that think of it as a big um, tea of goo and gross matter and lots and lots of animals. I mean, it's just amazing how much stuff is in the, the oceans. They're not just a big bowl of water. There's lots and lots of life there. How much life on a, on a scale comparable to land, land creatures? I don't know about the animals because that's not my, my area of expertise, but at least with the microbes, then the total biomass of microbes in the ocean is, I believe, equivalent to what's on land. The one that I know for sure is that the amount of microbes in the oceans is about the same as what's underneath the oceans. And then both of that, I, I believe, together dwarf what's on lands. It's just, it covers 74% of our planet. It's just a lot of space. And that's just area, not even including volume. Yeah, right. Exactly. How, do, how does the vo how would the volume work out? And I mean, you, you couldn't entirely get a volume on the earth, but you kind of could if you had like a five or a 10 foot average. That would be that would be interesting stat to see what percentage of the volume of the earth is actually water. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have that stat in my head. What was it like the first time you went under in a sub? Just thrilling. Just everything. It was it was like I didn't want to miss anything. Every my ears were just focused. My eyes were focused. I was just paying absolute attention to everything. I remember there was this crab that decided it was going to take us on. We had landed. We were 900 meters down beneath the, the surface waters in the Gulf of Mexico, and there was a crab that just stood there with its claws out, ready to just nail us. And I thought, wow, that's a just crab with some temerity. How deep have the deepest humans dove in crafts in craft? Um, so three, four humans have gone to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the Mariana Trench. They've gone to the bottom and how the Mariana Trench is how deep? It is, so oh, I'm going to mess this up, 11,000 meters, give or take. Um, yeah, it's more than Everest, right? Yeah, it's deeper than Everest is tall. Um, uh, the folks who have been there, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on the first two guys. Um, two guys did it in the bathysphere. I really should know who this is. Um, in the 60s, I believe. But much more recently, James Cameron, the director of Avatar and Titanic, um, built a submarine and went down. So he was the third person to go. And then much, much more recently, Victor Pescovo um, built another submarine to go down, and he was the fourth person. The rich guys have all the fun, right? you know, or all the risk. <laughs> or all the risk. I'm, you, I'm happy diving in submarines that have a lot of track record. Fair point, fair point. If you had the resources of, let's say, a small government, what would you want to dedicate a significant amount of budget to in terms of how would you, how would you focus on if you had un almost unlimited money to tackle one big problem? What would it be and why? Well, I would really tackle these, these unknowns and try to hit at what, what kind of life lives in these deep subsurface environments. And we still haven't really fully answered that question. Like, what are they doing? How, what is life like down there? Um, because I feel like it's just 
there, it's so unknown that there's just important stuff there to be learned. And that, that takes a lot of exploration and it takes a lot of drilling down, visiting the places, but it also takes a lot of laboratory work to try to like put the genes into laboratory organisms, to express them, to try to work with bioinformatics, to work with all their, their biomolecules to try to recreate what processes are happening. How do you handle containment when you're dealing with microbes from under the sea? For instance, European settlers come over to North America, everybody dies of smallpox because they don't have any immunity. You mean me contaminating them or them contaminating them, me? More them contaminating you when you bring samples back to the lab. Because in yeah. theory, we would have no immunity to something like this. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I don't know of anyone... I, there's no precedent for anyone getting hurt by any of this stuff. So there's, there's that. Um, but also if you think about organisms that are adapted to live in a place where nothing ever happens, once they get in our bodies where I'm just crawling with macrophages that are just like um, zombies killing everything that they meet that's foreign. Um, I think that they gobble up any of these sluggish, slow do nothing cells pretty quickly. Okay. What would you be doing if you weren't doing the work you did now, if you weren't a uh, oceanographer, if you weren't working in marine biology? I'd be a chemist. That yeah. was what I was headed towards. What would you focus on? I did biophysical chemistry as an undergraduate, and that's still really fascinating stuff. So getting protein structures and using novel spectroscopic techniques. Any particular problem you would try to tackle? Well, what I was working on then, and I may still be working on that now, is the question of when you solve um, protein structures, you often have a hard time solving this, like perfectly solving the, the structure of proteins that are associated with membranes. Um, aqueous phase proteins tend to crystallize better. And so when you get a nice crystal, this regularly ordered thing, you can shoot an x-ray at it, get a diffraction pattern, and perfectly solve the, the structure of it. With... Um, hydrophobic things or things that are associated with membranes, some of them are solved very, very well. And um, the, the field has done a great job of, of doing this. I don't want to put down other people's research, but it still is a, is a tough problem to solve. Like, how do you get them in their natively folded state um, if you have to study them when they're in the aqueous phase? Why would something like that matter? Um, we have a lot of proteins in our cells that are sitting in our membranes that are associated with lipids that are um, absolutely function, uh, essential to um, the functioning of cells. And this is where if you have, if you have um, poor protein folding, it can lead to long-term health long consequences. Long -term, long -term health. That come from bad protein folding. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, there's a bunch of oh, feedback all of a sudden. Feedback all of a sudden. Oh, sorry. Is it? Um, we're having a storm. It's beautiful, actually. That's really weird. Caspar, cut this part. Out. Wait. Okay. Is this still going? On? No, it seems to be good. Maybe I'll, we had a strike of lightning and a stroke of luck. My voice came back to me, and it was horrible. What's <laughs> it? What's it like being a scientist today in university? A lot of people don't really understand what it's like to undergo the academic life, so to speak. What's it like? So the first thing when I tell people I'm a professor or a scientist, and then I say professor, they say, oh, what do you teach? And, you know, it's, it's teaching is important, but teaching is not the primary thing that I, that I do. That's what I do in addition to the research. Um, it's really all about the research. Um, I happen to be at a university where I feel like I have a lot of freedom and a lot of support from my colleagues. And I think if I didn't have either of those things, I would be absolutely miserable. But I have found a, a spot where I can just do whatever I think is interesting and write whatever grant I want to write. And I have amazing colleagues and I get great students and it's pretty sunny. What's the batting average on writing grants if you're decent at it? Yeah. So when I first, I actually counted mine up. Oh, I'll say the number and it's going to make people depressed. It has gone down since, but I was at 50% when I came in, which is insane. I mean, you can see it like a batting average, like batting 500 is like amazing. Um, it has dropped in the past year to zero. <laughs> so maybe I'm <laughs> on average, maybe I'm normal. I don't know what it is um, on average across people, but it's, it's hard. You write a lot of grants. Have you seen it change at all under the current administration or has science still held a focus? 
So that has not trickled down to me very much. Um, I see very worrying trends um, in the upper levels of administration of um, governmental agencies. Um, I fear that we will be pushed to write climate change grants that are not really about climate change because people don't believe it in or something, um, which still confuses me. Like, it seems strange to not believe in it. Like, you can say, like, we shouldn't do anything about it. Maybe that's not a good position, but maybe that could be your position. But to say it's not happening is just weird. It doesn't even make sense. Um, I, I have not felt too much of, of the, the blowback from that. But you feel right the now. wind's coming. I do, but I mean, it's all pretty scary, but you know, you do what you can do and advocate for what you can advocate for. And do you think that's something that would potentially, the, the U.S. is very successful when it comes to science in the university system. It's way too expensive. We don't need to get into that. That's a whole nother story. And a lot of kids don't need to be going to college, but in terms of actually putting out innovation, the U.S. is, is pretty top notch. Do you see that potentially going away if we get another term? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if another term puts a time limit on when that would happen, you know, four years. But I mean, if, if somebody started making substantial cuts to the NSF, to the National Science Foundation, I would feel that. That would, that would definitely affect me. Uh, the shutdown affected us greatly. Um, that was very, very strange. I have a colleague who lost an entire field season in, in Antarctica simply because they couldn't deploy, because they couldn't get the funds for it. And these are funds that were allocated. They were there. There was just no one to administer them. God, you got to love that when you have people and paperwork and just too lazy or dedicated to have the wrong cause to do it. Well, it wasn't laziness. It was the shutdown. I mean, the government hmm. was shut down, and these people wanted to push that paper, but they were forced to sit in their houses and do nothing. I meant more on the part of the the congressmen oh, and women who were politicians. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the politicians. Let's let's not even get into politicians. They're uh, the, the dirty scum of the earth. Oh, they're the dirty scum of the under earth. There we go. We got our microbes right there. So I wanna I wanna jump into the bonus Patreon only listener uh, questions now. So if you guys haven't supported us on Patreon, disruptors.fm slash Patreon, we're doing a bonus three questions per episode in addition to some bonus episodes for you guys, if you're helping us to make this into a long-term success. So now, Karen, my first, th this was something I wanted to ask you earlier as well. I feel like people a lot of times go to far out, especially high up places to get a bit of perspective. Did you feel, so you look down from the mountains like, wow, it's so much smaller of a problem than I thought it was. Did you have the same type of feeling underwater where it just puts everything into that transformational, wow, I'm nothing perspective? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You just definitely feel like you're just this tiny little pinball in an enormous machine. You are it's tiny. Go ahead. Oh, it's a, just, you know, sort of being, being in, in a submarine in the deep ocean is kind of like having the very distinct feeling of being a pinball in an enormous pinball machine. Like you, you know that you're very insignificant. Have you ever had a comparable feeling? Oh, well, standing on a mountain also does that too. I had this feeling up on, uh, I think it was Mount Baker in um, Sequoia National Park or Inyo, I can't remember which one it was in. And I just looked around and I thought, this place wants to kill me. Like <laughs> I could die so easily and it wouldn't care. <laughs> it's a powerful feeling. Humbling but important. It makes us remember the important stuff. Let's yeah, jump back, let's really jump back to the episode now. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut mm -hmm. you off. Sorry. What? technology are you most worried about today? Technology that we have or that we don't have and I think we should. Can be either, can be nukes, can be AI, can be whatever you yeah. want it to be. Um, I'm not, I kind of, like I kind of feel like the scary technologies themselves are not my worry. The, my worry is more the humans controlling them. You know, I feel like we're going to have scary technologies. We always have, you know, the ability to form iron into swords was awfully scary when that first happened. Um, but, you know, all of these, we are going to progress. I think that there's going to be technologies that we can't even imagine. I, there has to be, it has to be in that arc. And I just hope that we cannot, we manage not to annihilate ourselves on these things. 
but I, I worry about climate change. That's what I, the technology that we're lacking right now or the will or, or whatever, but we need to, we need to deal with climate change. If you had a magic wand, how would you deal with that? Uh, a magic wand that can pull CO2 and methane out of the atmosphere um, would be, and then put it somewhere that it would stay for a very, very long amount of time would pretty much solve the problem. What if you had a magic wand that made you president for a day or a week or however long it needed to get one thing passed? Oh, to get one. I was going to say, like, if somebody gave me a magic wand to be president, I would hand it right back to them because I do not want to be president. It sounds no, horrible. No regifting. No regifting. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. See, that, that presumes that I know what the answer is, and I just don't. Um, that's just my pure ignorance, and I find that frustrating. And I find that inspiring because scientists are willing to tell you when they don't know. And most people are just willing to BS through their teeth to try to sound intelligent. I think that I think it's important to admit when you don't know what you don't know. There were a lot of times during the conversation where I had to fight to keep up. And I'm sure some of that showed through. But I'm sure at the same time, a lot of this is super relevant and important for people because there are so many different ways to make a difference. I got one last question for you, Karen. And that's if you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything. What would it be and why? I think that it is to our detriment to not explore the deeper. I think that it's a whole new world down there to return to that phrase and think of all the wonderful things that we know about in the surface world. Um, that's all going on down there, but in ways that we haven't discovered yet. And I just think that there's going to be so much coming out of this, this realm. I feel like oceanography especially, there's a couple of different fields, but every kid has that dream growing up and it's, every kid has a couple of different dreams, but a lot of them revolve around nature. You want to be the paleontologist to go dig up dinosaurs. You want to be the oceanographer that, or the, sorry, marine biologist that works with dolphins. You want to be yeah. the person going out and studying the stars and finding out, does E.T. actually phone home? I feel like people forget that as they get older. And it's important to point out these type of examples because most people, especially from education, get pulled out of that creativity and joy. And I think you can find it in nature if you go back to it. I absolutely agree. I don't think you have to do it as a profession. I think that can be your, your side gig. But I think that's, that nature is there and inspiring and it can spark creativity for anybody. It certainly yeah. does for me. There's a reason we have such an issue with climate change is because we're never outside. We don't remember what it's like to be in the natural world. Possible. Ah, Karen, where's the best place for people to find you and say hey? Um, Twitter. I'm at Archaea Rama. That's like Archaea party, and that's a type of uh, microbe that I study. It's A R C H A E A R A M A. That's usually how I'm gettable. And don't worry if that's incredibly hard to spell, which it is go to disruptors.fm and we'll have links and all the good stuff in the show notes, guys. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. It's a, it's a little bit of a deep dive, so to speak, pun intended. And if you have, if you're someone who's interested in advertising, if you've got a company that you think would fit with our values, Matt at disruptors.fm, we can chit chat a bit more. And if you guys want to explore a little bit more about the big and societal existential risks that most of past guests and myself they keep us up at night, disruptors.fm slash risk. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys soon. Cheers.